Hey, everyone. Welcome again to another one of my Gaudiumitspiz 22.com podcasts and YouTube videos. I'm very pleased today because it was a little bit delayed. I had to cancel the first time around. It was on my end, my fault, but we, an old friend. She's not old, but a friend that I've known for a long time, uh, Dr. Margaret McCarthy. And Dr. McCarthy uh, is a professor of theological anthropology at the John Paul II Institute for Studies on Marriage and Family in Washington, D.C., one of my favorite places. I have a lot of friends there, too. She's also on the editorial board of uh, the English edition of Comunio, International Catholic Review, North American edition, which is also centered down there in Washington. I believe you are still the editor of Humanum, the journal Humanum. Yep. Uh, which is a journal of culture, science, religion. Oh, it's a really interesting journal uh, across the board. You're a member of the Academy of Catholic Theology. And at one time you were a consultor, I do believe, to the bishops on doctrine. Yes, I still am. I still you am. still are. Very good. So you are a consultor on doctrine to the USCCB. Uh, got your doctorate at the Lateran uh, yep. In, in in Rome. What year was that? 93-ish. <laughs> 93-ish. Oh, all right. Let's let, you know, right around the same time I got my doctorate at, at Fordham. And uh, if memory serves, I, I swear I didn't look this up. This is from pure memory from a conversation. With a lot. You did your doctoral dissertation on the topic of predestination. Yes, I did. I did it under ah, um, got, got it. Angela Scola was my doctor fatter. And yeah. yes, it was on the recent developments in the theology of predestination. That's right. Yeah. So I, I is can can readers, uh, can viewers access your dissertation anywhere? Well, they can access um, an article I wrote about the, 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 the which sums it up in, 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 uh, in Comunio. Okay, uh, but also Nick Healy and I are working on a, 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 a co-edited book um, on the doctrine of predestination, which will sort of propose something that's sort of between, on the one hand, the quote unquote traditional doctrine, never taught officially by the magisterium, by the way, um, and universalism. So we Ooh. propose predestination as the reason why the world, as opposed to, so we resituate the doctrine of, we, we think predestination is rightly situated in the context of creation and provides the answer to the question why God who doesn't need the world creates it. And so that sort of changes a lot of ways in which then you solve, you know, different questions about the relation between grace and freedom, perseverance, uh, and uh, omniscience, omnipotence. Um, so that well, when is that out. who's publishing that that edited text and when is it coming out? Uh, that's still being decided. OK, yeah, yeah. Both we'll issues are still heavy hitters. We'll have a lot of heavy hitters in that. In that oh, in that. Oh, gosh, that sounds just absolutely yeah. fascinating. But that's not uh, the topic at hand today. Oh, by the way, welcome, Margaret. It's good to see you again. And good to uh, see you, Larry. We saw each other last November at the Word on Fire conference in uh, Rochester, Minnesota, yeah. which was, I have to say, a phenomenal conference. And the new journal looks really, really good. I was. Did you have an? Do you have an article in the, in the journal that just? I think you yes, do. Yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I haven't got my copy yet. That should be coming soon. I was supposed to have an article, but I'm really one lazy guy, and I. You are not. I, I never got around to finishing. I, I gave a paper there, but and I was supposed to flip Jonathan Sorello and Matt Levering were all over me to finish the article. And I just I, I fully intend someday to do so, but I have not <laughs> done so yet. But any, and I also have a book coming out from Word on Fire next year, but it's due in June or something. And I I'm way behind on that, too. So I don't know how much longer, how much more patience Word on Fire will have with me, but hopefully a lot. Anyway, that's not the topic of today. Okay. The topic of today uh, is uh, gender and the issue of gender, which is much in the news everywhere these days. I did an interview with someone that you know quite well, Dr. Rachel Coleman, on yeah. this topic probably two or three months ago. And I thought it was a fascinating topic, one that I've never really dealt with on this podcast before. And I thought Rachel did a very good job with it, an excellent job. 
but it really got my interest in this. And I, and I got a lot of positive feedback from my viewers on that interview and said, do more on this topic. And I thought, well, who else can I interview? And I thought, ah, I know just the person, Margaret, Dr. Margaret McCarthy. So I'm going to start with just a very sort of open and a generic question. You can take this conversation in whatever direction you want to take it. But I think for starters here, just to get this going, when, when you, when we hear the word, gender theory or gender studies as it's bandied about in the academic world today. What exactly is that? What's what's the essence of gender studies these days? And, and, and why is it problematic? Let me just rephrase that. What's the essence of gender? Let's go with that then. Yes. OK, very good. <laughs> so I would say gender is the weapon the atomic bomb of nihilism, because it attacks the prevenient natural order in its most pregnant sense. Pregnant sense is a, is a double entendre, of course, because nature <laughs> refers to birth and gender would uh, hide and erase, eliminate, wipe out all the evidence of our birth. I mean, for me to be a, a, a woman, to have been born a girl is to have been born of the sexual process, to have been born of a mother and a father. And so to, to put that into question, um, to sort of reassign myself with a new sexual identity is, is that. It's, 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 it's the wiping out of the evidence of a prevenient natural order um, and replacing it with one that I've chosen myself. So why would we do that? Um, I mean, to be to be born is, of course, to have inherited um, myself, to be have, to to be given myself. It's to be then. Um, it's it's even worse than that. It's to be caught up in a whole series of prevenient relations or entanglements. It's to be highly embedded, and I would say. Um, in sort of a normal sexual, in normal understanding of the sexual condition, um, understands ourselves to be deeply embedded and in three directions. On the one hand, I'm I'm the fruit of my parents, so there, there's all of that entanglement with that um, my 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 um, my forebears. To be sexual, I'm also <clears throat> always already kind of facing the opposite sex. You know whether I actually marry him or not. Um, my my whole bodily being sort of co you know implicates that. Um, then to to be a male or a female is to be sort of set up and apt for a future that's not of my own making. You know to to be to be set up for motherhood and fatherhood is to be set up for a future which is 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 highly volatile, so to speak, highly adventurous. <laughs> we might say. Oh, to say the um, least, yes. It's an adventurous future, which is, but it's not a, not a future that's in my control. Uh, each time a child comes or doesn't come, you know, my, it, it, you know, it changes me. And, and, and it's, it, it, it's, yeah. So all, all of these are, are highly objectionable in modern terms for all the reasons that we could talk about. Because again, I'm inside in, 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 in all directions, a prevenient natural order that I have not chosen. So ideologues of gender ideology are very straightforward about this. Uh, and I'll quote um, Susan Stryker, the, the man who calls himself Susan Stryker, uh, one of the foremost um, queer theorists at University of Arizona says in her, his, um, article, um, kind of a famous one called Performing Transgender Rage. Uh, Susan Stryker says this, the transsexual body is a technological construction channeling rage and revenge against the hegemonic oppression of nature itself. So it, 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 it's very clear um, that, 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 um, that, you know, the prevenient natural order has to go um, so um, in, a, in a sense, it's really, a, you could say more, I mean, it's an attack on, you know, the status of being, you know, attack on our finite condition. Um, yeah. Uh, the finite condition is, is, is so, so not only to be sort of in relation to my mother and father, the opposite sex, my potential progeny, but also to be in relation to the creator, 
you know, so um, Del Noche was, was very striking. Um, the, the political philosopher Del Noche said, um, you know, that, that today, you know, the, the, the nihilism of today that, that, that this, you know, gender theory represents and other theories, of course, also, <clears throat> it, it's an attempt to wipe out the restless heart, you know, the heart that's open and, and uh, made for communion with another. So in a, it really an attempt to suppress that relation and sort of close the gap on it. And, and sexual difference is sort of the key way in which we're doing that because it's the sort of mm, evidence on the ground, so it's the on the finite ground of, of, that, of the fact of that, 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 that fundamental openness to God. Yeah, I think Donoche so, is so really I, so, good. So it's really kind of a ground zero, I would say, gender is uh, in the sense that, and in a way it's, it's, it's terrifying, but it's also exciting because it's taking us to the most metaphysical level. Whereas in the, in the whole you know, 20th century, we were dealing with the sexual revolution, which was about you know, what we're supposed to do with ourselves and our sexual organs. You know, what kind of woman am I supposed to be? What kind of man am I supposed to be? Now we're talking about whether we are anything at all. So it's, it's really a, kind of at the bottom of things. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the quote struck that you just had where it just really hit me, where, you know, the, the hegemony of nature, you know, because I thought I thought what you were going to say was, you know, the hegemony of white cis male heteronormative patriarchy or something along those lines of the usual can't. But the uh, the brutal honesty of that statement is striking. You know, yeah, the hegemony yeah. of nature as such. And so it, it struck me that there was almost a, a kind of Manichaean, Gnostic, um, anti-cosmic dualism at, at, at play there, except that without any appeal to the spirit. You know what I mean? Um, so one wonders, since you're probably dealing in cases like that with someone who does not take the category of spirit seriously or the it, theological category seriously, what then is the self in, in such in such a view? Is the self something metaphysically real or is the self also simply a, a, a construct of some kind, ephemeral, uh, an epiphenomenal bit of flotsam and jetsam uh, yeah. that, that we uh, So go ahead. Well, I mean, in, 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 I mean, a lot of this is, is, is riding in the wake of the Cartesian bifurcation between the um, right. res cogitans and the res extensa. So the self is, I suppose, in a sense, the res cogitans, but uh, in the disembodied self. At the same yeah. time, at the same time, so, so there's always that. I mean, at the same time, the more sort of postmodern theorists of, of, you know, represented by, you know, Susan Stryker, by Judith Butler, and now, um, now, now um, by the, the man who calls himself Andrea Long Chu, who just put out a big essay, it came out a couple of days ago in the New York Magazine, Freedom of Sex, The Moral Case for Letting Trans Kids Change Their Bodies. That's just out. But anyway, um, um, well, probably Judith Butler says it the, the most. Um, in, in a way, she sort of she sort of understands that this you really can't conceive the self as just you know that 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 apart from the body. So to really to oppose the body is is, is also to also oppose the self. So she she personally denies that there is anything any 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 anything such as a self kind of an, an, an agent um, um, we, we are always um, we are always yeah. um, sort of um, what some hegemonic power has um, made us to be uh, and so there is really no we there's no I uh, the only thing that we or I can do is to constantly um, uh, trouble that and 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 you know by by disrupting it and um, um, it, you know changing you know changing positions. So the the language of fluidity is of, of course well known um, in Judith Butler's world. So the, the 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 point is to sort of remain in flux and fluid, so as never to be fixed in a, in a, in a position. But yeah, um, I mean her idea is that there is no such thing as a sort of 
a sort of robust agent self subject that the sort of moderns would have um, that that is then sort of affected by social conflict. That's why I, I brought it up because when you were talking about you know, the sort of rebellion against the hegemony of nature, it struck me that you know whenever that whenever that position is adopted, there, there's a self cannibalizing movement where eventually the self itself dissolves into into nothingness. So then you're left with the metaphysical question of, well, who is the agent to which rights accrue, if you even want to use that kind of language, or right. is there agency at all? And if there isn't, if there's no self, if there's no moral agency, if there's nothing, if it's all simply fluidity, what is it that we're fighting for here? And and how how is any definitional clarity as to what they're talking about really possible? I'm struck by the fact I saw some quotes from Judith Butler the other day where she was she was going on and on and on about how, you know, we can't let biology be our we can't reduce gender to biology, the whole, you know, nine yards. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but then the thought that immediately crossed my mind was then then why do we need surgical procedures to change the body? in order to make it conform to your supposed gender identity. If the body, if gender identity is a pure construct, I should be able to be a woman without, without having my naughty bits whacked off, you know, to, to you know, uh, so, so maybe yeah. you could come, go ahead. Right. You're right about that. And, and, um, and the man who calls himself Andrea Long too, just came out with a kind of response to that because his essay freedom of sex, the Moral Case for Letting Trans Kids Change Their Bodies is a review of Judith Butler's um, about to be released new book, Who's Afraid of Gender? And he laments the fact that she doesn't have a lot to say about, you know, um, you know, the, 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 the right to, um, to, to conduct um, trans medical experiments on ourselves. Um, and so he, he, you know, he, she uh, responds to that. I mean, you're right. With Judith Butler, you know, her position is that um, um, you know, you know, famously, um, you know, whereas the older feminist, you know, held that there was some sort of a basic kind of biological sex we could kind of hold on to. And then you have sort of social constructs that come in the form of quote unquote stereotypes, um, you know, that, that tell a, a girl how to become a woman, which kind of woman she should be, or a boy, which kind of man he should be. But with, with Judith Butler, you know, she, um, she goes further to say that, um, you know, that the hegemon hegemonic power conducted by who knows who, by the way, is um, um, has has even um, Im Im implanted in our very notion of sex um, ideas about it that that aren't just there in some kind of way that you could sort of speculatively grasp, but have been put there nefariously. Uh, and, and indeed, in the most deceitful way so that they look natural. So this is all playing on Foucault who's channeling um, Nietzsche. Um, but um, um, yeah. so, so, so for her, you know, whereas for Simone de Beauvoir, it's the girl that becomes a woman, a certain kind of woman. Um, for Butler, she questions that that body can even be called the body of a girl. So, so why should seeing those anatomical parts be called a girl? And the sort of the, 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 the sort of power play there is, by the by the by the by the by, by the powerful is um, is 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 to give us a, give us a notion of a kind of natural sex female from which then would follow or accrue a, a female identity. So you're right. So I, I I'm just restating your question and not answering it. Um, from from her point of view, there really isn't any good reason why if you know if I identify now as a man, I should then go change my body because why should I? Why should, why should the body I have be said to be the body of a woman, a, a female body? And so Andrea, yeah, I mean, so it's interesting um, uh, in, in the rec this recent article uh, by the man who calls himself Andrea Long Chu, um, um, uh, so what's the answer to that? The answer could be a kind of Butlerian answer, and that would be, um, that notwithstanding the fact that the body is in fact neutral and not in fact male or female, but since it appears to be to the general culture because of the, the because of the, the the way the power has a grasp on our minds, uh, we're going to trouble it with transgender surgeries. Um, 
Uh, but but what I think is interesting is is in this whole trajectory um, that that goes from Simone de Beauvoir to to classic feminists um, to finally the postmoderns is how much they really are genuinely troubled with the body. Uh, yeah. is, is it, the, the denialism about the body having any meaning it, uh, uh, shows so much, there's so much nervousness behind that denialism. You know, Kate Millett, um, uh, there's a wonderful statement I like of hers uh, where she says something to the effect that patriarchy is so successful, it passes its effects off as natural. So... <laughs> Um, in other words, it inoculates their argument against any counterfactual evidence. So if you say, well, gee, I really think I see something natural in there. Like, Aha, you know, that's the cleverness of the power. You know, it's paper. called poisoning the wells, right? You poison right, right. the wells. So it's this inoculate, inoculation against any kind of counterfactual evidence. Um, Simone de Beauvoir is the most fascinating on this. I, I frankly don't see a lot of difference between her and Judith Butler at the end of the day. She wrote The Second Sex, you know, and, and, and she, in, in a way, is the, the beginning of, she, she give, she's the first proximate cause of the, the question we're talking about, in a way, though she never even talked about gender. But um, she wrote a whole book, The Second Sex, to prove that... Um, you know the the weight of you know social constructs on um, on women, right? So the the big bad wolf was culture that was projecting onto the body, you know, certain meanings that it didn't actually really have. Those meanings being, by the way, marriage and motherhood, right? We're not even talking about wearing yeah. skirts and makeup. Uh, but then she, at the very beginning of the book, she she looks at um, there's a forty page uh, chapter on biology. Uh, it's called biological data, and that's very revelatory. Um, but, you know, once she goes through actually the, um, you know, biology as we know it, sort of modern biology at, at her time, and it's, it's, it's it, you know, it's, it's up to date. And you can see how nervous she is about actual biology. You know, she wants to tell you that, um, the you know, the, the, you know, what, you know, its propensity to, for motherhood and marriage are sort of just values that culture has placed there. But you, but, she, but she's genuinely nervous that, well, in fact, you know, the body is itself might, might be the problem. In fact, she says, you know, for, for women, the, the business of transcending nature is going to be a lot harder because she's much more immersed in, in biology. But I, um, so I, I suspect that all of this um, work, this mental energy to make us think that there's no there there yeah. is a sign of tremendous nervousness that there's a lot there. That, I mean, that's how I would say it. That's a good way to put it. Uh, one wonders, I mean, okay, so I'm sure in order to avoid the fact that they're actually in, in a strange way, giving a backhanded support to the concept that gender is binary. You know, in other words, I, if I'm a biological female, but I feel like a, a man, therefore I need to have biological male parts sort of added to me and to have my body pumped full of testosterone or puberty block blockers if I'm young. All of that is in some strange way, uh, a backhanded way of affirming the binary. Uh, so, but they don't want to affirm the binary and, and then go on to say, how many genders are there? So please explain to my listeners, what, what's that all about? What, what do they mean when they say there are more than two genders? What are some of them? And, and, and how do they ultimately think that they can escape the binary? Yeah, I mean, gender is, I mean, gender is any possible combination of, you know, what you think about yourself, you know, gender, gender is a kind what I would call a spiritual sex. You know, uh, I don't like the language of, I don't like the language of biological yeah. sex. I mean, um, sex is a, the phenomenon of an entire organism, but anyway, biological sex so-called is, um, so, you know, is the opposite of a spiritual sex, which is what gender is. Gender of course c concerns sex. Right. And sex. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, um, you know, it, yeah, I don't know. How do you get all these different um, ones? It's it's because you have um, 
well, you have male and female bodies, then you have, you know, much is made of, much is made of the various pathological conditions persons are born with that we would call disorders in sexual development. So there, th those exist. And then you combine that with, you know, I feel male, I feel female, I feel, uh, I feel both, I feel one at one time, one at the other. Um, and, and you do the math on that and then you get, you get uh, however many. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, so, yeah, I, you know, I, I, male body plus female body plus any number of um, what medicine, which is rightly called disorders and sexual development, plus the different sexual identities that I might have, um, you get this multiplicity. But I, um, a lot of this is a lot of this parodies, parodies the sort of basic um, male female binary. Yeah, it really does. And it's something is, I thought of you yesterday, actually, my, my viewers don't know, but I, I gave a lecture in, in, at, um, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota on Tuesday evening at a beautiful cathedral in Sioux Falls, by the way, big shout out to anybody who's never been to St. Joseph's, so Joseph's Cathedral in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, magnificent church. Anyways, I was traveling home yesterday. I was in Chicago at O'Hare airport now, I, I should have taken a picture of it, but I was in a rush and didn't. But it was a, a, a sign outside of a room that said gender inclusive bathroom. Yeah. And, and it had the image of the man, you know, the, the little cardboard cut out of the woman in the dress and the dude in the trousers. And then next to it, it had plus, plus, plus. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and I thought, well, why don't they have an image for those pluses? What, are, what yeah, do the yeah. pluses mean? You know? No, that's interesting. That's interesting. You still always have to have, yeah, in, in, in all kinds of advertising or, 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 you know, for any of this, you always have to have a male representative and a female representative, a male who looks female and a female looks male. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Because, because that covers it all. That covers it all. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I, I just, I mean, there's another, I mean, another thing, I mean, sexual, the, se the sexual difference, um, involves not only our relation between each other, but also the relation of the generations. And there's another way you, you could ask your same question is, um, um, you know, you know, all of this, all of these um, sexual identities, and then the changes we do to sort of match them, it compromise generation in one way or the other. I mean, they are the denial, ultimately, of the relation between um, sex and generation. So if, if I'm a female, it's because I was born of my yeah. parents. That's why I'm a female. If, if I'm a female, then uh, with respect to a male, it's, it's so that we can um, get, you know, get, get married and have children, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, gender in all of its permutations in one way or another compromises the link between sexual difference and generation. Um, in all these different three, three, yeah. three direction. And yet at the same time, I mean, the first thing, the first thing that uh, tra transgender activists want is children. They want the right oh. to. Right. So there's your, you know, there's your other binary, you know, the relation between sex and generation. Um, that's, that's front and center. That's, oh, yes. Of course, all of this requires that there be uh, biomedical possibilities to to buy to make and buy babies absolutely uh when the uh alabama court case came down like a month ago where i guess it was the alabama supreme court yes. declared that embryos are persons and that that called into question you know ivf technology yeah. those are one of the right. first and one of the first things that you saw coming from the the opponents of this idea where though well what are we how dare you take away the reproductive rights of transgenders and, and, and right. gay men and gay women and so on and so forth. so I, I i think you're right one of the first things that they that the, one of the first things they want are, are children which That's is right. ironic right it happened immediately after the uh, supreme court case um uh, confirming the right of same-sex people to get married i mean the day after you had um uh you know, legal rumblings about um, the right now to have children. So the argument was, what does marriage have to do with children? <clears throat> right? That would be the argument right. against um, same-sex marriage. Well, it doesn't, and now it does, right? Immediately. Yeah. Which is, it's it, their, their obsession 
with making sure that they have rights to surrogacy or IVF or, or, or adoption. Only once again, it's sort of a backhanded affirmation once again of the normativity of the old fashioned binary and and the fact that it does produce children. And that's one of its fundamental orientations. So that's what they then want to imitate. That is what they want to enter into. But it's it's fundamentally diabolical. I'm sure you would agree in the in, in the yes. sort of you know, the deep sense of the word that it separates things that belong to each other and then reconfigures them sort of in a, in a, in a new way. So yeah. things that belong to each other naturally are separated and then they're reconfigured in a contractual way. You know, I think so, that's really insightful. And for my viewers and listeners, I mean, the word diabolical, I mean, come diabolos. I mean, it's literally to throw things apart, to separate yeah, things. That's right. Uh, and, and what would be the that's it becomes diabolical in, in the more demonic sense when precisely what's thrown apart is then th reconstructed for other purposes that would be contrary contrary to to what we would so, we, so so i mean just an example is simply that um you know you separate um um sexual difference from parenthood from motherhood and fatherhood um so you have um two people who you know in principle cannot be mothers and fathers right they're 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 married or they're together in some way and in principle they can't have children so um um, um, and yet they want to, so, so then they want to have children they, then, and they have, then they have children in a sort of a new technological way. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so separating, so separating gener, ge, generation from sexual difference. That's what you're doing. Separating generational sexual difference. Now you have two people of the same sex, or you have, perhaps you have two people of different sex, but they've been so, they've been so compromised by their castrations and, neo vaginas and phalloplasties and and hormones that they can't have children and so they but they but they want to bring children into the relationship in this in this you know reattach children to their kind of couplehood um, in this new biotechnical contractual legal financial way right? of course in all of this to change gears just to switch gears a little bit um you have certain feminists. I think of feminists like J.K. Rowling, uh, you know, author yeah. of the Harry Potter stories, yeah. who's caught a lot of flack, and 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 others, uh, or I guess they're called turf, you know, yes. uh, trans exclusive something feminist. What's the R stand for? Trans exclusive radical feminists. Oh, okay, trans so, radical. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Our, uh, Rowling, Jermaine Greer, uh, Helen Joyce. Um, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, yeah. I, the, the, you, I was just wanting you to comment on, well, what is because these are not these authors, these radical feminists are not exactly Christianity friendly, tradition friendly uh, or who are not necessarily opposed to the notion of a sexual revolution that is transgressive in very radical ways. They wouldn't be opposed to that. And yet here they are sort of drawing a line in the sand and saying, no, this far, but no further. Why is that? What do yeah, they no, see? That's, that's fast. That's fascinating. Um, I read Helen Joyce's book, Trans, and she's a, a turf, I guess. Um, I think she calls herself one. So, so these are yeah, these are radical feminists who are uh, live in the wake of um, you know Simone de Beauvoir, um, who questioned therefore the stereotype of motherhood and marriage. Um, they are uh, fine with. Um, um, uh, homosexuality they're fine with contraception with abortion so um they're fine other words in other words they've emptied out womanhood of its sort of natural relation to the opposite sex and to children right um and, but but they're against this and they're against it i mean chiefly because um uh, they want to hang on to that sex class that they belong to and understand to be a class of, of, of victimhood. So they, they, they've needed that class in order to, um, you know, to carry forward the revolution. Um, um, and, and so, yeah, they're hanging on to that sex class. Um, at the same time, they'll say things like, um, um, you know, the, the transgenderism is, is um, it, it takes us back into the old stereotypes, you know, right. so... 
um, a girl is tomboyish and now she's got to become a boy, right? Whereas they fought there, you know, for decades against these, you know, stereotypes or it's homophobic. So uh, a guy like Skies, um, he thinks he's got to become a girl to, to carry that on. So it's, it's, it's stereotypical and it's homophobic, right? Um, so in other words, they want to hang on to kind of a basic kind of biological substratum that we'll call female or male, but they've, they've completely emptied it out of any of its theological meaning. Yeah. And they want to hang on to that. Now I have to say, um, I think they don't have a leg to stand on at the end of the day. I mean, what's biological sex? if it's been emptied out of all of its, if it, all of its meaning. Um, do you see what I mean? So oh, I, yeah. I mean, a lot of conservatives have made common cause with them. Um, and, and maybe I'm not questioning that in terms of maybe being politically expedient. Um, but I think a lot of conservatives kind of are tempted to sort of die on the hill of biological sex. Um, kind yeah. of with the turfs. It's like, we'll just, we'll go there and then we'll just stop there. And, um, you know, we'll agree, we'll agree that it's wrong for, um, you know, girls to be held under stereotypes and we'll agree not to be homophobic. Um, but, 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 but darn it, biological sex really matters. I agree with you a hundred percent. It troubles me greatly when I see, uh, thinkers of some depth even uh, who are sort of on our side of the theological aisle turning to the turfs and saying you know essentially well you know at least the enemy of my enemy is my friend and we can make common cause here but that's why in describing them i i deliberately use the word transgressive in their in their vision of sex yeah. because ultimately they share the same metaphysical concept absolutely as, as the trans and it's essentially just an endless series of transgressions against the normativity of nature the, the normativity of certain spiritual that's right. that's right they're just they're just stopping short they're not willing to go all the way and they're yeah. really tied they're really tied to the older notion of feminism that you know everything you know everything that's bad is sort of these cultural constructs that have been imposed on nature they're they're really they that's their, their mentality but I think I really much prefer the um, the um, Camille Paglias and the Shulamite <laughs> Firestones and the Susan Strikers who just come out and say what you know what what stands against us is really human nature. It's it, and particularly for women, human nature is really bad for women because we're more bound to it, like 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 to our physiology um, because of maternity and all that. Um, so, I, I, you know, they're, they're what you call Hobbesian feminists. They, they say that the, the problem isn't um, the political order imposing values on nature. Rather, it's nature itself, baby. That's the problem. And, uh, um, you know, yeah. there's this, in fact, uh, uh, the man who calls himself Andrea Long Chu, he goes out and says it. Look, our, our battle is against nature itself. I mean, we need to be against it because it's something we didn't consent to. And um, he he responds to all of these uh, turfs and a new new set of liberals called Tayrals, so trans agnostic reactionary liberals. <laughs> um, of the I've never heard of, that one before. Well, there you know these are these sort of journalists from the left to you know Matt Tahibis, uh, the Barry Weisses, who are kind of sick and tired of censorship and cancellation. I uh, think there's something wrong going on with the censoring of free speech, and I believe in free speech. And they yeah. think um, there's something really wrong about um, rushing young children into the hospital to get castrated and so on. So there's a base, they have a kind of modicum of basic common sense. Um, 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 I'm, I'll interrupt you for a second. Uh, you see this okay. same thing, for example, uh, in the in the UK, the National Health Institute just came out with saying we're not going to do surgeries or puberty blockers on children right. anymore. It seems like the health system in France is thinking about the same things. And yet yeah. both of those health systems, both of those countries completely dominated by an utterly agnostic, secularized the transgressive even view of, of sexuality, but there's perhaps a certain common sense that has kicked in 
that you just... Absolutely. And they're way ahead of us. And you could mention also the Scandinavian countries where you have doctors, you know, they've been doing this stuff for decades. Um, and you have doctors, honest doctors who've been complicit in these surgeries and experiments now coming out and saying, this is, this is doing harm. We're doing harm. But the real thing for a lot of these people is children. And that's kind of an easy one. We can all agree that children shouldn't be kind of hooded, right. right? So a lot of them think that, you know, children just don't have the ability to consent yet, right? So what does the man who calls himself Andrea Long Chu say? Well, none of us consent to going through to puberty. None of us consent to undergoing puberty. Uh. <laughs> that's, his, that's his comeback, his response. You see, puberty is one of the most biologically speaking volatile experiences that that any of us can undergo and none of us consent to that so you see there's this idea that by you know sex itself is is a reality and so he wants to say it is a reality but he says it's real like climate change is real like global warming sex is real so is global warming he says in other words it should be resisted <laughs> yeah, it's negative so would he be in favor then of uh, uh, as as a child is approaching puberty, give, being given the explicit choice through school and various venues of being given the facts of life. Here's what's about to happen to you within the next two years. Okay. Do you want this to have? Do you want to grow hair in places you've never had before? Yeah. Do you want to suddenly have sexual feelings? Uh, all these sorts of do, do, to the young girls. Do you really want to have your period? And so we can make that all go away if you want. And then be given that choice. Is that what he's advocating for here? He doesn't come out right and say it, but but I, I think if you ask him, he say absolutely yes, absolutely yes. Again, when he counters all of these, so he, the the article. So here's the article. I mean, it's it's a it's a it's a big deal right now. It made a big splash. I saw uh, it. I didn't read it, but I New saw York, it. New York Magazine. I, I was glad our our interview was delayed so I could read it yesterday. But um, it's really great because it's it's radical. And, and it states it states clearly what this ideology is ultimately about. Um, yeah, and um, uh, it, it, it's about undermining the, the uh, prevenient natural order. Uh, and, and yeah, and so, so, but he's nervous. So why did he write it? Because he's nervous about the, um, the growing concern among non-conventional types over uh gender transitions so the non you know the religious right that's the conventional the, those are the people you'd expect to be against it but then you've got the turfs and now you've got the tayrals you've got all these trans agnostic reactionary liberals so the journalists um, the new york times in some sense publishes a lot of articles expressing concern you've got abigail schreier coming from the left writing about the uh, rapid onset gender dysphoria phenomenon among girls, Matt Tahibi, and so on. Um, um, they're not necessarily against any of the stuff in principle, but they have a basic common sense. And they're worried about, so he picks up on one of their concerns, which is consent. Um, children are old enough to consent. They don't, yeah. And so, it, it, you know, again, in response to that, it's, it's fascinating and terrifying. Well, we don't yeah. consent to undergo puberty either do we does he deal with the issue of also whether or not psychologically speaking that a great deal of this phenomenon especially with young people is simply a social contagion of some kind does he even care if it's a social he doesn't contagion? care he doesn't care um because maybe he, if it is a social says, contagion it's a it's a disease we need to catch we are choice makers and and part of part of, of choice is to also regret our choices and um, that's okay. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah. Wow, that's really that's quite a quote there, Margaret. Yeah. Part of our part yeah. of our choosing is that we have the right to someday regret choices right. that we made. Right. Yeah. That's part of it. So, but at the end of the day, what we're really trying to sort of get to is 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 the fact that we haven't consented to our own birth. We've come into being without asking to be, and so. Um, gender is a kind of the day after pill, so to speak. You know, you can kind of abort yourself and um, rebirth yourself. 
sort of consent your way into being. Is this not, well, I'm, I'm just struck. I mean, this is like, this is the whole existentialist movement on steroids, right? I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's the radicalization of the existence before essence, right, right. the denial of any essence before. I mean, the denial of essence entirely, what you said, the prevenient, the prevenient reality that, that is given to yeah. us. So yeah. maybe if you could, I mean, is there an intellectual genealogy here that stretches back into existentialist thought? Oh, absolutely. Well, Simone de Beauvoir was, you know, uh, well, yeah, but, but, right, exactly. Channeling. Sartre, of course. I mean, I, yeah. you know, every every feminist has a man in the closet. <laughs> Simone de Beauvoir has Sartre, <laughs> uh, who, who, with whom she was a lover. Um, yes. And uh, Judith Butler had Foucault in the closet with whom she was not a lover. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, so no, absolutely. She makes no bones about it that her philosophy um, undergirding um, the second sex is existentialism and that what, what, what man is, that is human being is, to core, is, um, is a being anti fusis the anti-nature uh, in the sort of existential sense of transcending or yeah, transcending it. Um, that is over transcending in the sense of overcoming it. Um, oh, yeah, well, to be sure. So okay. it was also yeah. interesting about Simone de Beauvoir and then and then connecting it all the way with um, like Andrea Long Chu is is they're both opposed to the idea of an ethics that's bound by or in search of happiness. They're very explicit about that. We're not interested in happiness. To be interested in happiness would mean to sort of follow some kind of course of action that's suggested by your nature, right? Some kind of fulfillment and so on. But they're very, they're very, Andrea Chu is, is I mean, you, you should look at him. I mean, he's quite a sight to be seen. I um, will. That's really a real, that's a complete but, inversion of Christian he but makes I mean, no I'm bones just... that I'm not doing any of what I'm doing to be happy. Um, I'm doing it to be, um, you know, the kind of being that that a human being is, which is a choice maker who consents to everything, who rejects and is against everything that's prior to that. So he doesn't seek happiness, but he does seek a life. What's what's the word we could use? A life that's in some sense consequential. Uh, yes. You know, yes. As an, as an agent of some kind, consequential. Right. And it might be that I, in leading a consequential life, yeah. that, that I have to sacrifice happiness. That's, That's right. It's a very strange opposition. Yes. And, and it gives me some hope, actually, because how many people can live in, the, in this upside down? I mean, ultimately, we, we, this is why they have to resort, right, to kind of repressive tactics and the silencings and the ending of careers. And the, yeah, there has yeah, yeah. to be a kind of dogmatic inquisition imposed because yeah. they have to be aware that that nature will have its revenge in a sense, in the sense that 98 percent of human beings will want to remain within the ambit of of the natural world. That's right. Um Right. I mean, that's why I, I, I do think when you read these authors, you, you sense the nervousness all the time that no, no matter how much they attempt to say, there's really no there there, but there actually there's a lot of there there and they're caught up in it. Um, and that therefore, um, to live the kind of ideal life that we want to live as choosers and consenters and all that, we have to constantly be in a position of alertness. We can never rest. Um, yeah. Because to rest, we would we would find ourselves doing things that we haven't authorized. We have to always authorize um, everything that we do, um, and and that's why for like a butler, you've got to constantly shift. You've got to constantly um, flu fluidly move from one position to the next. Because to be in one position, you know, you might well you might rest and then kind of allow forces outside your you know your choosing to to take to take over and to yeah to prevene your choices yeah, um, yeah. And, and, and ultimately in some sense though i think they're doing us all a favor by being now more and more explicitly 
you know, bold in, in, in laying out their first principles and saying, here's where, and the reason why I bring that up is, um, and we can move on to this, to this topic is this, this greatly interests me. The Catholic, the Catholic intellectual response to this, the Catholic ecclesial response to this, I am greatly troubled and I don't want to speak for you, but I will speak for myself. I am greatly troubled by the fact that there are increasingly, and I just said an article about this in Catholic World Report, Catholic prelates, bishops, priests of high standing, who seem to be in good stead with the powers that be, yeah. who have now openly advocating for what they call LGBTQ yeah. plus issues, right. uh, without the slightest bit of apparent awareness yeah. of of the full ideological yeah. weight of what yeah. LGBTQ stands for. I often yeah. say to people, oh, we're supposed to be open, inclusive, inclusive towards the B in that bisexual. What does it mean for a church to be open to bisexualism? <laughs> what exactly does that mean yeah. that now if a, I, if, a, if if a man and his get, ma get male lover and his right. female lover all come forward, that we're supposed to bless them now or something along. And what does the T mean? And yeah. now we see what the T means. Right, 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 and right. so when you see a Cardinal McElroy or a James Martin and they use the word LGBTQ, one wonders, are they aware of of the full orbed metaphysical reality that they are endorsing? Yeah, I'm not. I, oh, they, they 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 might well be. And um, they might be complicit in, in trying to bring down any kind of robust sense of nature, which would apply to everyone always and everywhere, right? So yeah. in a way they're complicit in a kind of modern conception of nature, you know, that was forged um, in early modernity among the, yeah. the early modern political thinkers where um, you know, everyone's just a mere unit, you know, the, the state of nature is, is, is really kind of a using a concept of nature to authorize a completely new concept of nature, which is just units. We're just sort of um, 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 undifferentiated monads, um, uh, eviscerated of any content, age, sex. Um, we have no sort of natural relation. The only relations we have to each other are, are, are ones we've chosen and okay. Um, so they might be complicit in that um, modern conception. Yeah, and they want the, the, the tactic. It strikes me that they often take is that they like to narrow the focus of what they're, you know, that they're going to zero in on a specific issue, like, oh, we just need to be more inclusive in our parishes towards LGBTQ people or whatever. But what what never gets articulated is that that's the tip of an iceberg, that if if one were to accept the basic premises right. of what they're saying, what there's what you begin to then see is that they are seriously questioning the entirety of the Catholic moral theological edifice. Right. They're, they're, the seriously question, they're, they're seriously questioning the nature of God, who is unity and difference. They're seriously questioning the positivity of the relation in God in the finite world, which is a unity and difference. Yeah. Um, the, the entire created order, the nuptial mystery that's at the heart of it, the reason why the world was created in the first place. Um, that's a lot to put into question. Is there anything else? <laughs> yeah, really. Um, uh, yeah. And, and they're, you're right. They're, they're doing it in the name of being pastoral, um, which I personally think is a, a is 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 a ruse um, to to shelve and to put on a pedestal the the doctrinal part, which of course is ne we're never you know we're never touching, right? But yeah. you are touching. You are touching. Um, by the yeah. way, I mean, I also think um, um, they, they, they either understand or don't understand the extent to which the, uh, the, this ideology is actually producing the problem they purport to, to, to accompany, right? So, Good I mean, point. There's, yeah, please you know, elaborate. Who, does, who doesn't want to accompany hurting people? Who doesn't want to accompany hurting people? But without sort of um, identifying the, the, the ideological, con, you know, the ideology that's behind this, you're... you're you're not able to see that it's a kind of toxin in the air that's actually producing the 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 the, 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 the yeah the, the the categories of people that we uh, we 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 think of when we say LGBTQ in the same way that when Chernobyl you know had its uh, accident you know it it put toxins in the air that created a lot of you know brought about a lot of cancer um, so. Um, you know, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of kind of unwillingness to sort of face the um, the, the political revolution that gender ideology really is. 
and to sort of do the nicer thing. I mean, um, among the bishops who are less ideological, I would say there's um, there's the feeling that they need to show their sort of pastoral bona fides. Yes. Right. And really be worried, you know, and wringing their hands about the, you know, the individuals who are who are caught up in this. Um, yeah. And yet the Sorry, reason why you know, that, the that. reason why that's 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 dangerous uh, to anybody who's ever been involved with, you know, or understands the, L, you know, what what is truly going on in the LGBTQ subculture, that to not speak the truth of the gospel to these individuals, not in harsh ways, but in very forthright ways, yeah. is to withhold from them happiness and the only liberation because otherwise you are consigning them to a hellish form of slavery it would be like taking someone um who's in a wheelchair and pulling the wheelchair out from underneath him that's what you're doing oh that's a great analogy basically there's no problem here there's no problem here but 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 you know if you really want to help someone i mean many things you have to do of course and obviously tenderness is, is is is, is something you also yeah. need to show, of course, but um, you know, no no doctor in a in a normal medical facility takes in someone with a problem and just dismisses them and says there's nothing, there's nothing to see here. Um, yeah. You diagnose the problem and you 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 try to give the proper medicine. You know that. In fact, the old classical text on 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 pastoral theology from Gregory the Great is is just about that. The pastor is the one who leads his sheep to the good grass, the the grass that really nourishes him, amen, and protects him from the wolves. You know those telling him lies. But, yeah, but another church. another funny thing and sad thing among um, Catholic prelates uh, um, is that they um, are easily hoodwinked by um, um, the arguments that are used with great rhetorical effect by people like James Martin. And what I call the natural law argument or the born that way argument. Oh yes. They really buy that. And it's, it's, it's very useful in the Catholic environment because of course we Catholics believe in natural law. So, you know, who would want to deny someone who's born that way to, to continue existing that way. Right. It's obviously so fallacious. Um, people are born a lot of ways. You know? uh, yeah. um, and, and that's yeah. not really an argument. But 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 that's the, the, the tragic thing is that nobody in the world of gender ideology actually believes that argument anymore. It's, it's out of date by about 20 years. So Judith Butler 20 years ago scoffed at those arguments. Says, I don't need any metaphysics of gender identity, any born that way argument whatsoever to argue for why I shouldn't be this gender or that gender or whatever gender today, tomorrow, and the next day. Yeah. So I, I, it pains me to see um, uh, Catholics. Um, well, not are, only the fact that it, it, it's, they, it shows forth when, when I see Catholic theologians, prelates, priests uh, advocating this born that way arguments, I want to stand up and scream that they should have their theology degrees removed from them. That's right. It's such a That's monumentally right. superficial and stupid right. argument. In fact, it's a conclusion in search of an argument That's and right. doesn't really, because the fact is it opens up theodicy problems that are simply enormous. That's I right. had a sister, I was, I had a sister that was born with a severe heart defect. Yeah. She yeah. suffered That's for right. five years, some horrible years died. My parents were grief stricken, destroyed our family. And, and yet I'm supposed to believe that that was God's will because she was born that way. Give me a break. That's right. You know? Go ahead. No, I mean, if, if you were born without legs, it doesn't change the fact that the human being is defined as a bipedal animal. You know, if yeah. you're born with a broken arm, indeed, if, if every child in, 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 uh, in, in, on one given day at a hospital were born with broken arms for some odd reason, uh, that wouldn't make that normal. Uh, and the reason is simple: that arms are meant they don't have a have as their telos the ability to hold things, right? And so, someone born with some kind of disposition that makes it difficult to unite with the opposite sex, difficult to have children, is 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 someone born with a handicap, precisely because we understand sexual difference to be sort of oriented to generation. And that's how we know how however much you were born that way, it's it's something that cannot be said to be natural and ought to be in some sense 
treated or helped, frankly, a company, a company in the truest sense. Yeah. I mean, it's sad and it's tragic when individuals are born with uh, either, you know, like broken arms or defective hearts or uh some kind of strange orientation ultimately that's going to make them somewhat sexually dysfunctional in life. Those it's are all very deep. Tragic. It's very tragic. Yeah. And, and we, no one wants to, um, no one wants to um, belittle the tragedy, um, but it's far more tragic to take the wheelchair out from under that person and um, declare this. Um, yeah. Leadership. Well, it just seems to me too, that there's just now this increasing movement along these lines. So we're, we're very not based, but the, the gender question a bit, but it okay. is all really, and I'll just, I'll just say this too, that, uh, that people up, uh, people who are um, my readers and viewers who are a little more liberal are always on my case. Like, why are you harping on this gay stuff? Why, blah, blah, blah. Why don't you get back to your criticisms of the traditionalists or whatever? What's it? Because what is at stake here? And we've been talking about what is yeah. at stake. Yeah. It's a thread that if you pull it the uh, more than you realize unravels, Everything. and it's in our, in a, it's our inability to think metaphysical consequences through to their roots that That's causes right. people in our church to say that people like you and I, oh, you're obsessed about these issues and you shouldn't be. No, it's not an obsession. It's it's an insight into the fact that you are unraveling something here that you may not fully understand the consequences. And now one of the consequences that we're seeing, I want to bring this up, you see it in, uh, in a few uh, American prelates uh, whose names I won't mention, who are saying we need to take a serious look at <laughs> this classic distinction where you love the sin or hate the sin, uh, because, you know, yeah. that's impossible yeah. uh, because you, you have to be able to embrace the whole person. And that inevitably, if you're going to be condemning someone's sin, you are condemning that person. Uh, so I, I, I think that, that what there's yeah. the consequences in the church are beginning to unravel yeah. in this pastoral language of endless latitudinarian acceptance yeah. of everything. And right. that to say otherwise is to be a finger wagging pharisaical moralist. Yeah. I mean, just, yeah. I mean, I mean, no, no, no good mother or father could ever think of that way. Think that way towards his or her children. I mean, yeah. uh, you, you just have to love a few people in your lives to know how, <laughs> How untrue yeah. that statement is. I mean, it, I mean, well, I remember. Down, uh, it, comes I, of, it comes down to a failure of love. This, this, this. I haven't heard this argument that you're talking about. Or this, this, this new distinction. Well, but, for example, well, yeah, you see it now. I mean, for example, on James Martin's outreach webpage, there have been some statements to the effect of, you know, this constant love the sin or hate the sin. Uh, we we need to be more holistic. But then I think of the fact. And Cardinal McElroy's now famous article in America magazine yeah. of, of eight months ago, whatever it was, uh, which was sort of his manifesto of, you know, we need to change yeah, the teaching. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, in there, he said, point blank, we need to stop making distinctions between LGBT Catholics that are sexually continent and LGBTQ uh -huh. Catholics that are sexually active. And the reason he gave for why we need to stop making that distinction is that it it divides the LGBT community and stigmatizes half of it or most of it and so on. You know, and that's a that's a permutation of this argument of where right, right, right. Right. We, exactly. we, 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 we have to stop condemning the sin, because if we condemn the sin, then we're we're driving wedges in the LGBT. Yeah. Well, God forbid we drive a wedge into that community. Yeah, yeah I came to bring a sword. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and I came to bring a sword. Um, I mean, uh, Christ comes to bring a sword um, because he, he loves us. You know, and what is sin? Sin is a kind of negation. It's a, it's a, it's a form of non-being. Yeah. So, so to be against the sinner's sin is to be against the sinner's um, lurching towards non-being. It, it, oh, it's absolutely. To love, it's to love the sinner. <laughs> and I'm uh, glad you. Yeah. So we're sort of running towards the end here, but that's why I, I want to end on the positive, and and so I want to turn the conversation towards, you know, the fact that ultimately this is not a series of no 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 it's a series of affirmations about the the beauty and the joy to be found in the givenness right. of our existence that we are gifted 
that this is not a burden. I'm not burdened with puberty. Right. I'm not burdened with birth. I am gifted with those things. The entirety right. of the John Paul II Institute, right? Yeah. In one, yeah. what you what you've been doing, Margaret, for your entire career, is the theological exposition of, of David L. Schindler and others, their theology right. of gift. So maybe we could end a little bit with discussing that the church's ultimate response here is an affirmative one. It's it's a positive one rooted in this theology of gift. So maybe we right, could right, talk right. about that. Yeah, I mean, I do think um, the, the gender ideology in a certain sense um, hor horribly or beautifully embodies the logic of original sin, which is to perceive that God is jealously holding back something from us and sort of um, creating us in a situation of deficit, um, you know, where we're yoked to one particular place uh, in this finite world. And in, in this case, you, you yoked to one particular body. Whereas, you know, in the Christian, I mean, that's the logic of original sin. And in, 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 in so far as we accept that account of God by the tempter, um, you know, we, we cannot but want to be envious of, of what he, of, you know, of his position and to sort of close the gap. You know, that's the kind yeah. of idolatrous position um, that, that we all as original sinners sort of find ourselves in. And, and, and it finds its expression in gender ideology in the attempt to close the gap, to be everything um, as opposed to one particular thing. Whereas with um, the Christian um, idea of creation is that God, out of his rich um, communal being, creates... Uh, a world that can participate in that rich communal being. So um, the, 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 the world not being God is for us a positive thing. It's not a negative thing. To, 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 <laughs> yeah. to not be God is actually a positive thing. It's a reflection uh, of or an image of the fact that in God himself, there's a, a not. There's, there's a one who is not the other, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Um, and, and, and why that? Um, so that there can be a communion. It just comes down to that. Um, so the, the, the gift of being is um, on the part of the creator, a thorough giving over of being to ourselves, just the way the father gives his being thoroughly over to the son so that the, the son is himself thoroughly. Um, and, and not just an extension, a mere extension of the father. So too in creation, God gives us being thoroughly gives it to us, to ourselves, so that we are the agents of our very being. Um, but always as this kind of being, not every kind of being, we're born in a, in a rich uh, world of multiplicity, a cosmos that's, um, that, that, that's, that, that, that's in, in which you have a, a, a great community of, 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 of beings. And, and, and from the Christian point of view, being, if you will, um, you know, yoked to this body isn't a yoke so much as a possibility to to not be you <laughs> to not be you and the not being you yeah. or the mind not being a man is is not a deficit but the possibility for me to be with the man uh and and and, and do momentous things with him momentous things generating history itself generating society um to then be uh, to be co causes in God's project for the world to, to bring about the incarnate Son and and and, and so on. So, um, yeah, I mean the Christian account, and it, it, in a certain sense, Butler Judith Butler is really kind of playing on the doctrine of creation, but in a heretical sense. I mean, she she understands rightly that there is no substance that isn't given to itself. Every substance is something that's been put there, right? Right, she's right. right about that. So there, there's, a, there's a relation behind every substance, but she thinks the relation is nefarious and dark. And it just, just in the sense in which original sin sort of puts that idea in the mind of the first couple, that the one who put us here um, is, is jealous of his unlimitedness and is fixing us in place sort of uh, for his you know as a so so he can toy around and 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 be be, our, be a master but uh it's a misunderstanding the, too i think I, I think it's a misunderstanding too on a very basic metaphysical level of the nature of limit and yeah, limits absolutely 
and, and, and ultimately, therefore, it accounts for their rebellion against the very concept of form and formal structure. Yes. That it is limit that gives form to form and also, though, liberates the form to be something more than, in a sense, itself to constantly go beyond. But the removal, therefore, of limits on the grounds that they're simply restrictive ends form. Right. right. No, that's that's uh, you. You said it. You said it very well. I mean, in a way, um, um, I mean, the, the the problem is is the conception of limit as not good as a deficit, and that's kind of right. in the logic of original sin. Whereas when Mary reverses that, when she says fiat, um, she's acknowledging that she's not God, but at the same time, she's she can do that because she understands the goodness of not being God. You yes, see, I th yeah. It's the goodness of not being God, um, so that we can be with God in a communion. I think it's it was Balthazar at Heart of the World who said, "We're like God precisely in the fact that we're not God," and you know it, it, it's it's paradoxical in the extreme, but that's what he was. Love is only at a distance, he says, and that's so right. on. And so the, I I keep coming back to this notion of limit as liberating, uh, and and that we are limits are given to us as a gift. One of the gifts right. of finitude is precisely limit, right? right. Uh, the, out of which we are born into something greater. Uh, but but modernity modernity just simply interprets limit as as strict constriction. You know? Right, um, modernity and liberalism um, um, want to take us out of the limit and to uh, be because the limits. What's wrong with the limits? is well everything that sexual difference sort of embodies it, sexual difference embodies this limit that we're trying to get out of because it's it's not just a limit but it's a limit that embeds us in a whole series of relations with those who we are not and who are not us yeah. right and um um, um so so to, to to take ourselves out of that um is 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 to allow ourselves to always choose our relations and always therefore um choose relations that the the, the terms of which we set to, to never be in relations where you know we are um ever bound by something again prevenient um yeah, yeah. Thing, um complicated and troubling something that's um you know out, out of our um out of our power and doesn't it lead to and i agree with that very much. It, it, one of the things that strikes this is purely subjective on my part. But one of the things that strikes me, and I don't know how quite to put this, if, with the entirety of, of this modern movement of tra you know trans this and critical theory this, is how ugly it is, how profoundly uglifying it yeah. is of existence. And it goes to me to the heart of this of this denial of form. Yeah. If you eliminate form, you eliminate oh. beauty. Yeah. You eliminate beauty. And so it struck me earlier when you said he, he, the guy doesn't he doesn't care whether he's happy. He, he just right. wants to be that's consequential right. or whatever. And I thought that's so ugly <laughs> that that's an ugly worldview. And I think ultimately, doesn't that have to matter on some level? The ugly, the sheer ugliness of this. That's so interesting because the the the, the article that just, just came out by Andrea Longchu is that's um, what I was trying to think. Yeah. Preceded by a. Uh, uh, um, uh, a, a photo collage um, by a photographer who spent years taking thousands of pictures of transgender people, and yeah, I mean the 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 first response is not pretty. Yeah, yeah. And so I mean, beauty is the thing that it, it, it elicits it, that draws us. Beauty is something that draws us. Yeah. And and. It, it, it makes sense what you say that to sort of cancel the um, transcendental of beauty is to once again to sort of um, um, remove ourselves from within that pull of reality. So beauty is something that it has a pull on us. Um, it really and, does. I'm reminded, yeah. God, maybe 30 years ago now, I'm, I'm aging myself. Down in Washington, David Schindler held in his in his old house there and above his garage or whatever it was, the these little fides at Ratio conferences. Yeah. You remember those things, right? Yeah. And one of them, and Hauser and I were down there, Rodney Hauser. Uh Jean-Luc Marion was there. And uh 
it was a very interesting talk. I don't remember most of it, but one thing that stuck out was where he said that it, it, you know, it won't be too much further into the future. He said in which Catholics will be the only, when he was talking about sex uh, and sexuality and he goes, Catholics will be the only ones still doing it kind of in a beautiful way. The right. old way, the old fashioned way, the natural way will be the, the only way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. And that's how babies come out, yeah. you know, and 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 of course, he was being half joking, but half serious yeah. that we are approaching this rapid dissipation and dissolution. And that's that's the sort of end game that we're sort of now in. And so but th that gives me hope, doesn't it, Margaret? Doesn't it give you I mean that and the, 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 in the sense that the church's message will be the last last man standing It'll be the last thing worth even paying attention to which is why i do get upset with those quizlings those fifth columns within Brilliant. the church who you know Brilliant. who are waving the white flag and saying oh no 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 we need to give up the old-fashioned ways we just need to double down on all this new stuff it's infuriating yeah i mean um my favorite quote of all times is from Chesterton at the end of Heretics, where he says basically that the Christians will be the last custodians of the natural order. Um, yeah. And that's so interesting that um, what's interesting about our time is we're not the ones who are upholding the sort of truths of revelation, you know, the doctrine of the Trinity, the hypostatic union. Right. Like, although we are in some sense, but, you know, we're defending um, in the name often of religious freedom, things that really have nothing to do with revelation that would be available to the naked eye or to, you know, with, with the light of reason, so-called. To, to, yeah, to yeah. Of fetus at ratio, right. Um, 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 so he says this, uh, in the future, everything will be denied. Everything will become a creed. It will be reasonable to deny the stones in the street. It will be religious dogma to assert them. It's rational that we are all in a dream. It's mystical to say that we are all awake. Fires will be kindled to testify that two and two make four. Swords will be drawn to prove that leaves are green in the summer. We, Christians, shall be left defending not only the incredible virtues of human life, but something more incredible still. This huge, impossible universe which stares us in the face. We will fight for visible prodigies as if they were invisible. We shall look on the impossible grass and the skies with a strange courage. We shall be those who have seen and yet believed. Wow. I haven't read Heretics in years, and I had forgotten about that quote. Thank you for uh, reading that. That is that that's that fantastic. Awesome? That is powerful. It, it almost chokes you up. It's so powerful. Yeah. So what, what chokes you up about it is how prescient it is. Yeah, how, absolutely. And, and it's testimony to the fact that a Catholic intellect that Chesterton had has a capacity for perspicacity, has a capacity yeah. for going right to the heart and soul of a thing because of their faith. Right. And that is what gives them the ability to be so prescient. Yes. Yes. To look forward yes, like yes, that. yes, yes. Because he probably wrote that when the 1930s or something. Uh, 1905, actually. Oh, 19. Do you believe it? I mean, I, oh, I just happened goodness. to. See, I sorry, I had the date here, but um, um, yeah. Um, I always so think Chesterton really was of a later era. Yeah, but he's not. The Christians yeah. are in that position now, and um, there's something. There is something though about Christianity that makes us capable of of staring the universe in the face yeah. and accepting it. And, and I, I suppose we have to say that, um, you know, without Christianity, it, it, it is understandable um, why it's so, if you will, natural or automatic for people to want to kind of take a spaceship out of reality and get out of here. I mean, that's kind of the trend of every pre-Christian mysticism is to get out of here, right? Yeah. To deny the difference. Yeah, now we'll do it on Elon Musk's starship instead. Right, right. Yeah, you know, so there, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting um, kind of paradox. Why is it, why why is it that those who believe in the Trinity in in in, the, in, the, in God incarnate, um, who are also the ones most capable of staring yes. in the face the visible universe? Uh, wow. 
Well, perhaps that's an apt way to wrap things up here. Uh, we've been doing this now for almost uh, an hour and 25 minutes or so. Uh, so that's about that's about the end, as long as I like to go with these. Um, do you have anything else that you would like? To, uh, first off, thank you for coming on the show, Margaret. I think this has been an absolutely stellar, fascinating conversation. One of the best I've had in a long time. Thank you so much for coming on. Is there anything that you would like to add before before we sort of sign off here? Yeah, I, I mean, maybe just that what's at stake here is um, in, in gender is 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 whether uh, we will allow ourselves to have a common grasp on reality itself. I mean, to accept gender ideology is to um, is to sever the link between language and reality. It's to to make impossible any common pre ideological co natural judgment about things. Um, so it, it's, it's to sever li links with the real and to sever the links among ourselves. And so we, we, we need to understand, you know, there's the big questions at stake here. There are, well, you brought up the, you brought up the issue of language, right? Then we could do a whole another hour yeah, and a half yeah. show sure. just on the, the, the importance of language and, and, right. and the role that it's, that it's, that it's dissipation has played in all of That's this, right. but maybe that'll be down the road for a different day. Hey, thank you, Margaret. It's a Dr. McCarthy, I should say to my Dr. Margaret McCarthy. Margaret will do. Uh, oh, by the way, too, before we get out of here, I should have done maybe a little more research. I was like I said, I apologize. Uh, for, I, I didn't communicate with you in advance for a bunch of questions. I've been so busy this past week traveling. But maybe do you have off the top of your head the article from Comunio that you were ref referencing or that is a sort of exposition of your dissertation on predestination do you know what what issue of communio that was in so the viewers can look it up i don't remember what issue um but they can go to the communio web page type um, in your name type in my name and it'll and it'll be clear yeah um there's also one i wrote on this question so and this question that would be closed yeah. The emperor's new, new clothes. Oh, that's a great. Oh, oh, why didn't I think of that? Now, is that one of the ones that you can link to online? Do you know? I think so. I also really like the one that Rachel Coleman wrote with Adrian Walker in the issue called um, Saving the Differences. I was channeling a little bit today. I have to give them credit. Uh, oh, that, that's oh, that's a, oh yeah. Uh, well, yeah. that's a, that's, that is a saving the differences. That was a couple years ago, right? A couple years ago. It's just, just like a five page article. It's, it's really great. Um, it's a very good article. I remember and for those of you who don't know, Rachel is a former student of mine and of yours. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and now she's, she, she growed up now she's out there yeah. doing her own thing and she's yeah. doing well. And of course, Adrian Walker is, you know, Always just a, well. a, a, a brain on two legs and yeah yeah <laughs> we all love adrian Absolutely. so at any rate thank you so much and, and i uh if i wasn't a complete luddite i'd have like notes posted on here with you know all these articles and so on but people can look it up hey thanks margaret thank you so much thank you very much larry it was a pleasure thanks for listening everyone